Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by Lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10 day trial, visit Lynda.com slash C101. That's L Y N D A dot com slash C101. And by DigitalOcean. Simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code C101 in the billing section for a $10 credit. On this episode of Coding 101, it's time to jump into Rails. Welcome to Coding 101. It's where the power of code compels you. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. I'm Lou Maresca. And for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour or so, we're going to let you into the secrets of the Code Monkey and the Code Warrior. Now, Lou, last week we had a chance to speak with Carlos Souza, and he gave us a fantastic introduction to Ruby. But you know this. Ruby by itself is interesting. But until you put it into a framework, you don't really have a powerful language, right? which is why this week we're going to go into Rails. Uh, have you played with Rails at all? Yeah, I have. It's actually a pretty easy language to get a hold of, and a framework to get a hold of, and a tool set to get a hold of. And again, it gets you really quick up and running, and so I've played with it a little bit to kind of get going and understand where everything is going in, in the web. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's been my, my experience with Ruby and with Rails, which is it's an easy language to learn, and then when you start doing all the hooks, you start going, Oh, wow. Why, why doesn't every language yeah, do it that way? Why isn't yeah. every framework like this? Now, we're going to get into that, but uh, as is our custom, before we do that, we got to cover a little bit about the news. Now, uh, Lou, you've got a little something something here about what it, coder to programmer. Now, we've talked about this, pro, this paradigm before that we're, we're not trying to put anyone down, yeah. but there's clearly a difference between people who have just learned how to regurgitate code. Or you know maybe offer up a couple of insightful uses of, of different logic trees, and then the programmer. And the programmer is the person who just has that skill, has that desire, that passion right. to keep finding out new ways to solve a problem. Oh, uh, what does that mean exactly, though? Yeah. So th this was a really great article. I thought I'd bring it up. Um, it's from the Firehose Project, which is, is actually a Ruby project. Um, but what they're doing is they're trying to teach people how to become programmers, not just become coders. Coders are just you know people who just learn how to do the language slightly. They they need a lot of tutorials. They need to kind of uh, have a lot of people walk through the walk them through stuff. It, this whole idea is it's how do they become? They talk about what they call the inflection point, and that's the point where you realize, oh my gosh, I'm now a programmer. Mm, okay. Yeah, and actually, I, I could see that because it's it's very easy when you're just doing a boot camp. Because let's let's be honest, boot camps are kind of the rage. It's that's sure. how you learn it. Yep. Rather than sitting down and, or going to a traditional schooling method like a, a university or a college or even a trade school, you want to get eight weeks of just intense, immersive programming, right? I mean, that's exactly that's, right. that's yep. the thing. But even in those programs, there has to be at some point you realize that you've got enough of the knowledge. You've got a critical mass of knowledge about a particular language where you realize, oh, I can start taking this off on my own. I no longer have to follow the examples that are given to me. Right. I can figure out another way to do X, Y, and Z. Right. Yeah, so they, they kind of break it up into two points. So they say there's what they call the tutorial phase, which they say it's around three to eight weeks. Uh, and they talk about how you start to recognize patterns at that point, but they're still kind of walking you through things. Right. They're slowly walking you through things. But then there's the second point where it's called the inflection point. And that's the point where you all of a sudden just realize, wow, there's a bigger world out there. Let me start moving beyond that and doing my own thing. And there's something very similar to that. There's um, a guy by the name of uh, Dave Thomas, is, which you know him as the Wendy guy. but, no. <laughs> but He does guy, not make burgers. <laughs> not but, this guy. But this guy actually, he, he wrote a book called The Pragmatic Programmer. And he also does a lot of talks externally. And he talks about this model called the Dreyfus Model of Understanding. Uh, and that model, um, it has, uh, I think it's five different layers, if I can remember correctly uh, and that it talks about like as you start out as a novice and you you still need people to talk tell you how to do you really only can do 30 minutes worth of work and then you start to move into what they call the advanced beginner mode and that mode is where you 
you start to really kind of understand things, but you still need kind of hand-holding. But then you get into the point where level three, where you're competent, where you now you can, you realize there's a bigger world out there. Um, it's kind of like a two-year-old where it begins to walk, they start running around the house thinking they own the world. Um, but it then it's to the point where they, they get to the front door and they open the front door and they realize, wow, this world is a lot bigger than I experienced. And that's the level four, that's the proficient. That's realizing, and, and at that point, you almost feel like you take a step backwards because you realize, wow, this is a much bigger world than I experienced. I need to learn a lot more. Yeah. And mentally, you take that step backwards. Well, but that's natural to learning. And that, that's, that's going right. to happen in any programming that's language right. where you realize you're not just looking for that solution that you have stored in your memory of, oh, I, I know this pattern, boom, this is the solution. But you realize, oh, here's a pattern. I wonder how I could solve this. That's right. And, and I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. That's that, di that differentiation between the coder and the programmer. The coder is just going to keep regurgitating the same sad solution, right. whereas the programmer is going to say, there might be a more efficient way to do this. That's right. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about that pattern recognition, because that's not the first time I've heard about it. And we actually haven't talked about it much on Coding 101. It's something that every programmer and coder needs to have, which is when I look through the logic tree of what I want to happen, what are my inputs, what are my, my goals, my outputs, right. and what happens in between, I need to start recognizing certain patterns. And, and those patterns will determine what algorithmic solutions I use. Uh, when, when you're programming, what are the patterns that you most often see? So it's normally it's all dependent on the data that you're using. So like for instance, okay. the pattern that I like to follow, like for, for instance, by doing like lots and lots of customer data around maybe understanding their, their geolocation or something like that. I need to understand the data before I start to understand the pattern. So that's a big one to follow. Another thing is understanding the system that you're using, because a lot of software out there, there's third-party software, third-party systems and services that you use. So you need to understand how those services are being used so that you can understand how you can you can regurgitate that service and be able to understand and use it. So those are kind of two things I like to follow. Yeah. Now, speaking of patterns, we had a chance to uh, once again speak with our code warrior, Mr. Carlos Souza, and he's taking us into the Rails framework now, which is perfect because in order to use a framework properly, you really do need to recognize those patterns. Uh, we will be jumping over to Carlos Souza in just a second, but before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the first sponsor of this episode of Coding 101. Of course, the first sponsor of this episode of Coding 101 has to be Lynda. Now, what is Lynda.com? Lynda.com is the online repository for knowledge, for all knowledge. Be it you a developer or someone trying to learn new business skills, or maybe you just want to pick up a hobby, Lynda.com is a place to go online when you need to pour knowledge into your knowledge hole. Now, Lynda.com for us has been a place for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to take better photos, design a responsive website, master Photoshop, or sharpen your Excel skills. Well, Lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. Oh, Lynda.com is a series of courses that I recommend in particular. It's called the Foundations of Programming. We've talked about this on Coding 101. If you don't have the foundations, if you don't understand what's actually going on, then what are you doing? Now, there are installments covering fundamentals, working with databases, data structures, design patterns, code efficiency, and more. There's even a Fundamentals on Programming for Kids. Regardless of your experience level, you're going to want to check out the series. Lynda.com also has their Essential Training Series, which covers different programming languages like PHP and jQuery, as well as developing for specific platforms like Android and iOS. Now, uh, we here at The Brick House have been using Lynda.com for our transition from, a, from a, 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 a Apple with Final Cut Pro to Windows PCs with Adobe Premiere Pro. Lynda.com is perfect for that kind of knowledge because they've got searchable transcripts, because they've got excellent videos, because you can go straight to the answer rather than putzing around with video after video after video. Now, with Lynda.com, you can watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching and they're the top in their fields. You can stream thousands of video courses on demand and, most importantly, learn on your own schedule. That means that you learn at your own pace, at, at, your, at your own desire. Courses are structured so that you can watch them from start to finish or consume them in bite-sized pieces. Now, you can take notes as you go and refer to them later, and you can download tutorials and watch them on the go, including access on your iOS or Android device. Now, they let you create and save playlists of courses that you want to watch so you can queue up your learning. Lynda.com really has something for everyone. Speaking of something for everyone, your Lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, and I know you do because you're watching Coding 101, 
I want you to visit lynda.com slash C101 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C101. And we thank lynda.com for their support of Coding 101. Thank you, Lou and Padre. I'm here on the Skydesk, and I've got a chance to speak with our Ruby and Rails guru, Carlos Souza from Code School. Carlos, thank you very much for coming back. Thank you very much for having me, Padre. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Carlos, last week you, 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 you dropped the knowledge on the Coding 101 Army about Ruby, and you showed us why it is a language that is, is more concerned with how programmers program rather than with how computers take that code and turn it into something that they can understand. And we saw some very interesting features from Ruby, but now we're moving beyond Ruby. You want us to move into Rails. Why is that? Rails is a framework, but... Why can't we just stay with Ruby? So Rails is a web framework that takes Ruby to a whole nother level. It's built on top of Ruby and the same productivity that it gives Ruby programmers, it gives uh, 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 web programmers. So we can program now for the web with a huge uh, productivity. I got it. So, so Ruby, yeah, of course, Ruby is a language, and Ruby is a very interesting language, but Rails allows us to take that and, and push it server side. Exactly, exactly. It allows us to build full stack web applications, All right. enterprise ready web applications. Now, if, if, I'm, if I'm a complete noob here and I've, I've just started getting my feet wet in Ruby and now I'm moving into Rails, where do I start? Uh, the first place to start would be the Rails website itself. So Ruby on Rails, I'm just going to Google that because I never know. So rubyonrails.org is an excellent website that you can go and uh, check out a bunch of resources. And uh, there's links to, uh, you know, screencast presentations, books, and uh, a bunch of other stuff. And then towards the end of the episode, we're going to talk about a couple of different places where you can go to try out Rails in, in the browser. So that is that is my my recommendation to uh, try and try and see uh, uh, what Rails is all about. What, what, what kind of complexity are they looking at here? I mean, let, let's say that they followed your homework from last week and, mm -hmm. and they have a decent working knowledge of how Ruby works. Mm -hmm. How much more complicated is it going to get to install Rails and, and get that up and running? Uh, installing Rails, uh, it, it really depends on what type of machine you're using. On Windows, it tends to be a little bit more complicated than on, uh, on Mac and, and Linux machines. But it's not super hard. It's not super hard. Okay. All right. Now, once they've got that installed, and uh, you know, we may have to do a know-how on how to get that that uh, up and running. Just because I know there's going to be one, some who want a step by step. What's the first part of programming that they're going to want to get into? The first part of programming in Rails is uh, I want to say just start your Rails application. So this is what's cool about Rails. Well, it gives you a bunch of commands to create stuff for you because Rails. It tries to combine, it tries to group all of the best practices and conventions that are used across the majority of web applications. So it gets you, it gets you out of the door, giving you 80% of what all the web applications need. So all you really have to worry about is those 20%, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Okay, so now I've started it up. And if I want to create my first application, how would I do this? Let's do it right now. All right. Okay, so I'm here in my terminal, and uh, I have Ruby installed, and I'm using version 2.2.1, which is the most recent version as of this recording. And then I already have Rails installed, and I'm using Rails 4.2.1, which is also the, the, the most recent version as of this recording. Now, uh, I don't have any files at all, and I'm going to tell Rails I want to create a new application. So let me clear this up. All right, cool. So Rails has a uh, has a command line, which you you know is the Rails command, and it gives us a couple of hints as where to proceed. So if you just type Rails new, it's going to say, hey, you need an argument uh, uh, for new. So the argument is going to be the name of the project, which is also going to be the name of the folder that will create for us. So let's create a project called Reading List. And when we do Rails new reading list, it's going to create a bunch of files, a bunch of folders inside of that new reading list uh, uh, folder that it just created. So now if we do a ls and list the, the files, we can see that there's a reading list folder. Let's jump into that folder. 
And uh, let me make this a little bit smaller. And you can see there's all these files that Rails automatically created for us. Before we jump into them, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just run our Rails servers. So each Rails application comes with its own standalone Rails server. So that's what I'm going to run now. And to do that, we run Rails server or just a shortcut Rails S. So we run that. So our server is started and it's saying it's listening on localhost port 3000. So if we go now to localhost 3000, we can kind of see the default Rails welcome message. Mm, okay. And what's cool about this, if you've ever worked with any other web framework or pretty much any other programming language, you know that uh, 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 each step you take, you want to make sure that you're going in the right direction. So when you load localhost on your brand new Rails application and you see a page like this, this is a success message that you were expecting, right? So everything is working, Rails was properly uh, uh, installed, which you know, and uh, your application was properly created. So it not only gives you the success message saying, welcome aboard, you're writing Ruby on Rails, but it also gives you a couple of hints on where to go next. Uh, what so what would be some examples of that process not going well? The dependencies don't get set properly. It does not start up a new server for you to use. Is it is it is as long as I get that message, everything is good? Or are there certain other things that I need to make sure are there before I step into the next uh, uh, the next procedure? So for this first step, if you see this page, you're good, right? Okay. Some of the errors that you might encounter are maybe you're running another service on port three thousand, oh, okay, right? And then when you try to load. It, you see a different page, right? And when you see a different page, you might be surprised. Well, I thought I had my Rails server running, but perhaps you have another another Rails application or a different uh, a different application altogether running on that port. So you might you might see a different message. So this is kind of like that's you know that safe safe point where you see this, you know that your application was created successfully and and everything is running. At this point so by and far for our audience who will probably not be running any other rails installations who will probably not have any other services running on the machine that they're going to be program programming on as long as they get to that screen they're good to go exactly all right that screen is good to go now step us through cool now let's go and create our first little uh custom uh page and Rails is, uh, is an MVC framework. So it follows the MVC uh, pattern where we have our models, our views, and controllers. And these different aspects of the application usually uh, uh, are concerned with different parts, right? So that's the typical way that we split our concerns in our application. It's something is either goes either into a model, a controller, or a view. So let's start with uh, so let's start with the routes file, right? So in our routes file, we want to tell it uh, that we want to go, say, to welcome, right? And if you want to zoom in here, it just says slash welcome. And that's the URL that we want to add to our application. So let's go ahead and open our routes file, which again was created by Rails for us. We did not create this file. So if we open it up, we can see there's stuff already written in there. And it's, uh, again, another really cool aspect of Rails. It's, it's pretty, pretty good documented. So as you can see here, this is actually the documentation on how to use the routes file. It's telling you how the routes work, how you can write your routes, and different examples of code that you can write oh, in there. Okay, nice. Nice start. Right? Yeah, so it's always a good reminder. So I'm going to go ahead and create a root route. A root route means that every time that we go to slash, we want to go to this specific controller and action. So the root route is going to be welcome index, which is the same thing that says here in the documentation, right? So just for, uh, for example purposes. So now if we go to the application again, uh, our server's not running, so let's <laughs> close this, run our server. There we go. And run localhost 3000. Right. Now we see this error message, and it's saying uninitialized constant 
welcome controller, right? And it's it's I want to I like to say this is a good type of error because it's it it tells us what to do next. Basically, it's saying hey, we couldn't find the welcome controller. So the next step is to create this welcome controller, which we haven't yet. So I'm going to leave the 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 server running in this tab. I'm going to open another tab and create our welcome controller. And it's going it's just a class that inherits from action controller. Application controller, I'm sorry. Now, if we save this, and this is what inheritance looks like in Ruby. So we're creating a class that inherits from another class. And this is a class uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a Rails class, basically, right? If we go back and run our page again, now it's saying, it's giving us a different error. It's saying it couldn't find the index action for the welcome controller. And the action is nothing but an instance method, oh, very okay. similar <laughs> to the ones that we created on the previous episode, there we go. Okay. right? Yeah. Now, so, application controller, that's a, that's a default, right? I mean, that's just what's yes, contained a, in there. Yeah, application controller, it's actually, this was uh, this is application controller. Oh, all right? right. It already exists in Rails. Right. So it created it for us, right? It's there. So all of our controllers are going to inherit from application controller. And as you notice here, application controller inherits from another controller called action controller base, right? So this is pretty much the pattern on most uh, object-oriented web frameworks, or pretty much any object-oriented framework. It's just, it's just, it's so a framework is a toolbox. So it basically gives you a bunch of classes that inherit from other classes. And when you want to create your application, you create your classes. And you inherit that, from other classes. Exactly, yeah. that inherit from the frame, from the classes from the framework. So, all right. So index controller. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to render a text straight from the controller. So what I'm going to do is render, call the render method, pass in a, a, an options hash saying, oh hi. When we run this again you can see oh hi is printed to the screen. Uh, can I define other destinations within that controller? Yes, you can. And uh, when, we start, when we start doing something, a couple of things more uh, complex, we're, we're going to see different actions, different uh, routes. So this is the, so the index action is typically used for listing stuff. So we're going to look at other uh, methods or other actions to create stuff, to delete stuff, to update stuff. Okay. Right, so we can see we've rendered uh, text on the screen. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, right? Right. So this is just plain text. If we open up the source, you can see this is just plain text, right? But what if we want to return some HTML, right? What if we wanted this to be, you know, an H1? It works, it's an H1, but it's not really good if we start writing our HTML inside of our actions like this. Yeah, that would right? get a little unwieldy. Really, that quickly. will get yeah, yeah. kind of weird. So this is a controller. Now we're going to move on to the view. So let's move on and create a view file. And if we look at the folders that Rails creates for us, it already creates a folder for view, as you can see here, the last one. So all of these folders were created by Rails. We didn't create anything. Mm -hmm. So inside of our views, we're going to create a folder that's named after our controller. And this is so that we can leverage uh, uh, something that Rails calls conventions over configuration. So if you follow the Rails conventions, there's very little stuff that you have to configure in your app. So I'm not going to say where to look for the welcome view for the index view from the welcome controller. By following the convention of naming the folder welcome, which is the same name as a controller, Rails knows how to look for each action named after, after uh, that file. So what that means is I'm gonna create an index file and I'm gonna use the, the ERB uh, templating language. I'm sorry, so this is just a folder. 
And now I'm going to create the index.html.erb. And then inside of here, I'm just going to write HTML. Okay, well, that makes much more sense. Yeah, that doesn't need to be in the controller. Exactly, right? So I wrote my HTML and just make sure that my controller now doesn't have any of this. And if I render it now, you can see it still prints all high, right. right? So just so you know, let's create an H2 from template. Right, so this is the template. So as you can see, we didn't have to write the code that said to look for this specific view when we hit that URL. This is all a convention. We can even take this one step further because we're not doing anything in here. So we can pretty much just kill this, right? And Rails still knows that it needs to render the index view. No. Uh, is it just because it's a default? I mean, because if there's nothing in the controller. Yes. yes, it's the convention. Okay, all right. Got right? It. So, yep, that's the first step. Uh, now, let's say that we want to add some uh, interactivity with the user, right? It's going to be very basic stuff. So uh, let's add some links here. Let's go ahead and do... Uh, Let's do a link, right, to a search engine. And what we want, all right, so if you're familiar with HTML, you probably figure out what this is going to render, <laughs> right? It's going to render a link. When we click, it takes us to Google, right? Okay. Now, this is the pure HTML. We can use Rails helpers to write this for us in a much shorter syntax. So we can say link to and http.com. Uh, I think f search is the first search. Yeah, like that. And again, we would, we would just be using this for consistency. Yes, for consistency and then also because it's, yeah, it's it's more of a Rails style as well, right? You don't have to remember, uh, you know, the HTML syntax. Although this is a very uh, simple example, uh, Rails has helpers for other stuff as well, right? So right. if you want to send a, if you want to link that, that's an email, it knows what to do. And uh, yeah, so, okay, so let's stick with the Rails one for now, right? So search, Google, you can see the link down at the bottom. It's going to open up Google, right? All right. Okay. So okay. That, that gives us our controller. That gives us our view. Yeah. That's not, it's not, there's no interactivity yet. Right. It, it's, so what we want to do here is add a query string parameter. So we want to be able to set which search engine we want to use. So suppose we wanted to use Yahoo instead of Google. Let's say that we want to pass this as a URL parameter here at the top. Okay. Right, so all we're doing is saying search equals Yahoo, and we want this to point to yahoo.com instead of google.com. Uh, Zach, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, zoom in a little bit on this just so our audience isn't squinting so much? There we go. Yep, so yeah, we want to be able to pass query string parameters. So in this case, Yahoo, or if we're going to use Bing, we want to use Bing, and we want this to be point to Bing instead. Okay, right? so let's do that. So now, yeah, we have to define our index action because we're going to be setting an instance variable here. And again, this is where the object-oriented uh, oriented principles come in place. Anything that we set here, any instance variable that we set inside of this action can be accessed from our view right. using that string interpolation technique that we learned. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you remember from our previous uh, Ruby example, this is pulling out a variable and evaluating and replacing it, right? So right now it's just hard coded to Google, right? But it should work, still work. So if we go here, uh, it's not supposed to be big, but so yeah. So here you can see at the bottom is google.com, right? We click it, it goes to Google. 
Of course, now we need a way to make that not a hard-coded variable. Exactly. So we need to read from the query string parameters. So let's go ahead and do that. So here, we're going to read from our params. And this is an object that we get from Rails. And let's call this search, right? And there's our symbol again. So now... Anything I put up there. Anything you put up there, it's going to replace. So now if we click here, it takes us to Bing. How many parameters can I pull in? As many as you want. As many as you want, all right. Yeah. So if you do Yahoo, it takes you to Yahoo. Nice. But if you leave this out, it's going to error out. It doesn't have a value for that. Right, because you didn't fill, you didn't fill the variable with anything. Exactly. So oh, can I, de I can set a default parameter, can't I? Exactly. Let's see how we can do that. So there's a couple different ways. I'm going to start with the more verbose and then shorten it up, right? Just like we did before. So we could do something like this. So let's do, uh, yeah, so let's do, if there's a param search, we're going to set search to param search. Else, we're going to have search equal to google.com. Perfect. <laughs> and close this, right? So in Ruby, anything that's not uh, 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 null or false evaluates to true. So if there's a value set to search, this is going to evaluate to true, and then we use that to set to search, right? How good is uh, Ruby and Rails at uh, garbage checking and uh, error correcting? If someone starts typing in some really strange parameters, do I have to throw a lot of logic into that to make sure that they're not trying to hit something on my back end? Uh, if you follow the Rails conventions, you don't have to worry too much. Because okay. I want to say, the, the, the same way that Rails gets you 80% of the way or into building web apps, it protects you from 80% of the stuff that's out there and that's a uh, 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 typical attacks on web application, right? right? That, so, I mean, that's one, of the biggest, yeah. that's one of the biggest issues with Java, which is Java will yeah. basically just do what you tell it to do. And if you, if you didn't tell it to check for that, you'll be right. in trouble. So Ruby, right. by default, if you're following the conventions, which you're handing Rails. out now, oh, sorry, Rails, it, it will take care of 80% of that. Yeah, okay. yeah. A lot of stuff will be taken care of for you. So if you, we're going to see uh, uh, in the next episode, uh, when you're using the Active Record framework, and it already protects you from SQL injection and a bunch of other things of, uh, of web attacks. Right, which so, is 90% of the script kitty stuff. Right, exactly. All right, keep going. So, so, okay. so, now, so now we've, we've got a way to have a default value. We've got a way to, to take parameters and put them into, uh, into our, uh, our, our yep. uh, uh, view. Uh, what's next? So let's just shorten this code. So this is like the, 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 the most straightforward way if you're coming from other languages. Oh, right? so now you're going to give us the Ruby way to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you can say search. It's going to be search. And then let's just kill everything here. Or Google. Oh, like that. Some pipes. I love it. Yeah. So yeah, that's the short circuit, right? The or. So because this evaluates to false if it's empty, it's going to jump to the other side of the pipes when it's false. And it's just going to set to Google. It seems so strange to me, but yeah, that's a better way to do it. It's such right. a better way to do it. Right. So just to make sure it works, if we render this, no question parameters still takes us to Google. All right. Right. Now let's add a very simple business rule here. So let's say that people were accessing our site and they were misspelling Yahoo, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to zoom here at the URL, you're going to see that I'm misspelling Yahoo. Instead of uh, Y-A-H-O-O, -O, I'm saying Y-A-H-U, right? So if we try that, obviously it's going to link to exactly that string and it's going to take us, well, look at that. It redirects. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, nice. that's that's not you. That's Yahoo being clever. <laughs> yeah, that is Yahoo being clever. Let's do something else stupid. All right, Yaha, right? Yeah, something like they that. Can't, they can't have them all. <laughs> yeah. So let's say people were misspelling it, right? Calling it that. 
So we wouldn't want this link to be to Yaha. Let's say that we wanted to correct this to point to Yahoo for everybody that passed this misspelled version, right? So what we could do is something like that. How do we write it? Yaha, two, three, four. That's one way to do it. That would be a very complicated way to do it. You'd have to essentially come up with all the different ways they might misspell. Right, right, right. Uh, but it, it solves our issue, right? right? So right, right now, uh, it's linking to yahoo.com, right? But that is not really the problem that I wanted to point out. The problem that I want to point out here is the fact that we're writing this logic inside of the controller. Oh, right. Right? And like you said, if we were to match on all the possibilities of misspelling, right, we would have to <laughs> come up with a bunch of different things. But the, 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 the point here is not that the, the logic for solving this is stupid, which is because it's sort of contrived. But what I, what I want to point out is, is that the logic for this does not belong inside of the controller. Right. Right? It belongs inside of the model. Mm -hmm. So where, that is where the business logic should go. So instead of having this over here, the, 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 the next step, which would be to abstract this business logic, like I said, to a model. So I'm gonna, just going to start writing what the model will need to look like, and then we'll create the model itself. Okay. Right? So let's say that this would be sort of like search term new. And again, remember, this is just a Ruby class. This is the constructor, right? And uh, instead of search, this would be search term. And search would be search term. And I want to call this engine, something like that. Right? So we'll move all this inside of our model. At model, we're going to call search term. And another convention, we, we're not telling Ruby where to look for this model. We're calling the model here in our controller, and we're naming a file in the models folder. So we're not telling Rails how to find that model. We're following the convention. So I'm going to create a class called search term. Inside of that class, create the constructor. If you remember here from the controller, the constructor takes the param search. So I'm call this search, and then we'll do all of our business logic inside of here, right? So in that example, if search equals ya ha, then uh, return Yahoo. else return search. And remember, we went over this in the previous episode, we don't have to write explicit returns. Right. It figures right? out what you want to return in. It, fi it figures out that it's the last statement of, uh, well, actually, I, I did this wrong. It's not an initialize. It's on engine. I'm sorry. Okay. So that was a constructor. And now we're getting closer to what the, uh, an MVC should look like, which is exactly. the, the view is just the stuff that we see. The controller is just updating the state and the model is, is actually uh, um, uh, 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 changing the view when a state has been changed. Exactly, exactly. So you can see, so controllers shouldn't have a lot of code inside of their actions. Yeah. Right. You might want to keep it around maybe two or four, you know, and perhaps you're setting flash messages on controller. But the thing is, business logic should not go in the controller. That is the rule of thumb. Yeah. So, yeah, not, right now we have our uh, our model here that's doing all the logic, and uh, let's save that, and then our controller is just calling in the, mount, the model, and then we can see that everything still works. When we try to access Yaha, it corrects to Yahoo, or if we pass Bing, it knows, oops, Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, right here. Yep. Yep. 
So it knows, you know, Bing, or if we default, it knows that it's not. That's one thing we forgot. So uh, let's do this here too. Uh, if uh, we can actually do it up here, right? Search or Google. There we go. Right, the code that we had mm -hmm. over there. Right. So you can see we're, we're changing the model. We're not changing the controller, right? The API is still the same. And this is a good example because right now, because uh, I don't want to introduce this yet, but this is a perfect scenario for unit tests, right? To write automated unit tests. And if we were to write automated unit tests for this model, we wouldn't have to re rely on Rails to run those tests. We right. would write very focused and very fast unit tests that test our business logic for our application. Uh, Carlos, we are just about out of time for this particular episode, but if okay. you could, I'd like for you to pass on some, some final wisdom to the folks who are wondering about this uh, model view controller model. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you've said a few times, as long as you stick to convention, stick to the convention, things work better. Uh, you know, it, Ruby and Rails will protect itself and you get everything where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. could, could you please explain in no uncertain terms why it is so important that you not put business logic in the controller and why you keep the view to only the things that the user should be able to see? Explain why those pieces need to stay where they are, otherwise things break. Mm -hmm. uh, first, because it, it just makes the application easier to read, it makes it easier to understand, and it makes it easier to maintain, not only by you, but by other people working on your team. Because chances are the controller will respond to different actions. So if every time that you need to edit business logic for one specific action, if you need to edit that same controller, and then you have other people working on your team, chances are that you're gonna have multiple people working on the same file which increases the chances of conflict if you're working with something like Git or uh, 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 Mercurial or some sort of version control system, it's going, it's going to cause uh, a bunch of errors and conflicts. So, and it's, it's also harder to test. So the, the, the thing is, if, you, if you're able to organize your stuff in, uh, in components, in modules, calls, so to speak, if you're able to focus each concern where uh, 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 on different places, on very focused, on very granular uh, components, it's just easier to maintain your application and it's easier to have more people in your team working on the same code base without uh, stepping into each, other, each other's toes. Carlos, thank you again for being our Ruby and our Rails guru. Uh, next time we're gonna be stepping beyond basic input output. I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, but I understand you've got a little bit of homework for the folks at home who, who maybe want to, to catch up on what you've been doing here. Yes, absolutely. So if you're at home and you want to try uh, 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 to take one step further than what we did here, what I want you to try to do is I want you to try to be able to read multiple arguments from the URL and generate multiple links. So suppose that in the URL, we want to be able to pass Bing, Yahoo, and Google, and then the view needs to print search Bing, search Yahoo, search Google. There you have it, folks. That's the challenge. The gauntlet has been thrown. If you do come up with a viable solution, make sure to post it into our Google Plus group, and we'll show it off on that episode. Now, uh, Carlos, I, I know that you're at Code School, and we learned last week that Code School is a great place to get knowledge about programming. No matter what kind of web programming knowledge you want, what kind of web application you want to build, you're going to find it with the experts at Code School, and I, I treasure that. That's fantastic. But could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? I know your GitHub is impressive. If they want to go a bit beyond what you're teaching here, that's a good place to start. But where else can they find you on the interwebs? Absolutely. Uh, my Twitter is, uh, Twitter handle is Kaike. It's down here below my name. And uh, yeah, that's what it looks like. Uh, people can follow me over there. And also on uh, codeschool.com or on, like you said, my GitHub is the same, uh, same handle. Uh, Kaike, they can check out all the projects that I, uh, I, I contribute to, my personal projects, all the open source stuff that I push out there. And uh, 
I think we mentioned uh, Rails for Zombies at some point. Yes, yeah, actually. <laughs> Do yeah, it. So, yeah, so if, if people want to try out Rails but uh, don't want to spend the time installing it on their machines, Rails for Zombies is, uh, is one of our uh, free courses at Code School and is a great way to get your feet wet and see if this Rails thing is for you. And uh, it's all in the browser. Like I said, you don't have to install anything. And uh, you get to code Rails and, uh, inside of the browser. So you watch a couple short minute videos. And then after the videos, we'll give you a couple of challenges that you, uh, you can go through and earn points. And uh, yep, that's it. And uh, get a badge and all that stuff. And by the end of the course, you should have a pretty good idea of uh, the Rails architecture and sort of the conventions, some of the conventions that we talked about here. And uh, you can figure out whether or not you should invest any more time into your, uh, into your Rails journey. Right, how are you? There you have it, folks. We give you a little bit of a taste here on Coding 101, but if you want to dive deeper into Rails, and you should because this is an exciting framework, go ahead and, and try uh, Rails the zombie way. Uh, again, Carlos Souza from Code School. Thank you very much for being our code warrior, our code guru, and we will see you next time. Now let's take some time to talk about something that is near and dear to every code warrior or code monkey's heart, and that is, what do you do with your applications, your services, your hard-earned programming once you've completed it? Well, the old way was to build up some servers, build up some iron, maybe buy a rack or a server in a rack or a piece of a server in a rack in a colo, and maybe you can get your service up and running. Now, of course, you had to manage that. You had to make sure it was running, and it was your responsibility to update it and do all those things or hire someone to do it. Well, yeah, sure, you could go that route, and that's probably the route that I started off with because I like getting my hands dirty, but that's not really the way it works anymore. These days, you want to be able to take your application, wrap it up, and get it running immediately. And that's why we've got DigitalOcean as a supporter of coding 101. Now, what is DigitalOcean? Well, if, you've, if you're an experienced code warrior or just getting started, then you know what DigitalOcean is. It's a flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting option. DigitalOcean provides developers with droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed quickly to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and pretty much anything else that you can think of, all with root access. Uh, we've been using DigitalOcean here for the last couple of months to play with applications that we think we want to deploy either in-house or to the internet. It's a great way to test our programming and maybe even open it up to members of the public so that they can help by hammering it to, to break it, to show us the exploits so that we can make everything right before we go full public. Well, that's what DigitalOcean is for. Everything from sandbox to full production. DigitalOcean is built by developers for developers, and it's used by over 400,000 of them, including me. You can deploy and configure your droplets via a streamlined control panel or simple API. You can choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD. One-click install allows you to quickly deploy apps like Django, Docker, Drupal, LAMP, GitLab, Me MediaWiki, Node.js, WordPress, Ghost, Magneto, OwnCloud, Ruby on Rails, and more. Now, all servers are built on hex core machines with dedicated ECC RAM and RAID SSD storage. Servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigabytes of memory, and 640 gigabytes of SSD space. They're highly scalable to meet the demands of a rapidly growing application or business, and auto backups and snapshots let you easily clone, deploy, and resize your droplets as you grow. Now, my personal favorite is the fact that these are going to be deployed in regions across the world. With gigabit speeds, that means 99.99% uptime. You get full feature DNS management to, and easy, easy to manage domains. Or, if you want, you could use dedicated IPs. They give you full console access with HTML5 plus SSH, SFTP, and KVM slash VNC for virtual desktops. They've got an extremely active community with a large and detailed set of tutorials so that you can use your droplets with the support of your community. If you want to deploy Docker, well, go ahead. If you want to set up a personal VPN, you can do that. If you just want to run yourself a web server, well, DigitalOcean's got you covered there too. And really, it's so easy to, to get started. You can just deploy your own cloud in literally minutes. Now, here's what we want you to do. DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing that we think you should take advantage of. Their servers start at only $5 per month. 
There's also hourly pricing available for when you need to get that, that project done, that, that sandbox, or maybe that burst of traffic, starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so that you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code C101 for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code C101 in the billing section for a $10 credit. Now, Lou, I like this whole bootstrap thing, this, this idea that you run the Rails command and it will build out all the dependencies, include all the libraries, and give you this nice playground to work in. Uh, it's, it's, it seems like that's how every framework should work. <laughs> it really should. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, why don't I see that more? <laughs> <laughs> so there's, a, there's actually a bootstrapper web framework that's like built in JavaScript that does something very similar. So they're starting to learn from things like Ruby and Rails where they can start to bootstrap and bring everything in what they need at runtime, even at compilation time. So this is kind of the key. But they, they're the ones that really started to do this in the yeah, beginning. Yeah. Uh, one of the pieces that Carlos talked about, which uh, I, I, I've been playing a lot since, uh, since the pre-record, and it, it's absolutely true, and that is in order to get the efficiencies out of a framework, you have to follow the conventions. It's not optional anymore. It's not like, well, I'll follow the conventions when, it, when it's good, but if it's going to take me a while, I won't. If you don't follow the conventions, you might as well not use the framework. Right. Uh, and uh, like the example that we used here was having welcome as the folder for your controller. If you don't do that, none of the other hooks are going to work. Right. Uh, do you see a lot in, uh, of that in, in other framework languages? Like when you're working in C Sharp and uh, you're lurking, working with you know, the model and the view and the controller, is there a convention that you've, you've trained to use? Yeah, I think that that's a problem is like a lot of times the frameworks that they, they come out with, they, 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 they target one specific thing. And if you don't follow that one specific thing, sometimes you move outside the rails, I guess you could say, you start to lose that, the, the advantage of using those frameworks. But yeah, I think there's a lot of times where um, if you have a framework that, that doesn't have those, those conventions, they're just very generic, it's easier to use. But in this case, you want to follow those conventions. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, sort of a two-sided sword because, yeah, the bootstrap process really does cut down on the amount of scuttle work that you right. have to do. But at the same time, if the bootstrap's not leading to what you want to do, right. you end up spending a lot of time kind of pushing it back the other way. Mm -hmm. Or you just break the conventions, at which point you probably shouldn't be using the framework in the first place. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Well, so what, what uh, tips could you give? Because you are our permanent code warrior. We may have guest code warriors, but yeah. you are permanent. What, what tips would you like to give the audience about the use of a framework? It doesn't have to be Rails. It could be any framework that they're, they're going to pick up. As they go along, how do they define the strengths and the weaknesses of each one? So like, like Ruby and Rails, it's a framework plus a toolkit. So like for instance, um, some frameworks like in .NET, you have, to, you have to go all the way in. You're all in when it comes to a framework. So sometimes when you're choosing a framework, if you feel like you need to go all in, that's when you need to understand whether you want to take on that big, big role of going all in on a framework or not. There are some frameworks that are, you don't need to go all in. There's some that you can say, okay, I'm only going to do part of this in Ruby and then part of this in something else. And in that case, you don't have to learn everything uh, or you have to really understand everything. But in things like Java or, you know, or C Sharp or you know, even Ruby, these are things that you sometimes have to go all in and understand everything from the top to bottom. There you go. Go all in. Go all Wise in. Wise words from our permanent code warrior. Now, Lou, unfortunately, that's the end of this episode. Next week, we're going to be jumping straight back into Ruby on Rails. And in fact, Carlos Souza is going to be letting us in to uh, how we manipulate persistent data sets. So it, we're finally going to get to like real work. I mean, it, it's been a lot of setup and showing right. us how it works and, and how servers get set up automatically so we can test. But now we have to, to, to try our hand at manipulating data and making sure that we don't break things as we're as we're programming. Right. Yeah. Uh, until then, though, there's a there's a place that they can go if they want to find all of our episodes. You know where that is? I think it's twit.tv. Yeah. Yeah. Just go to twit.tv/code. There you'll find all of our back episodes, all our back modules, and you'll also find a little drop-down menu that will allow you to automatically have every episode of Coding 101 dropped into your device of choice each and every single week. If you want it on your iPhone, we can do that. Uh, but if you want it on your Android device, we can do that. Your Mac, your PC, your laptop, your desktop, we've got you covered, partner. It's because, you know, we love you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's also, it. don't forget that you can find us on the Twitters. You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at 
Padre SJ. You can find me at, at Lou M-M, L-O-U-M-M. Yeah, and uh, if you follow us there, you'll find out who we're going to be talking to each week and the, the languages that we'll be covering. It's also a great place to ask us questions. If you've got questions about programming, questions about some of the topics that we've covered, Twitter is a great place to go. Also, you can jump into our Google Plus group. Just go to Google Plus and search for Coding 101. We've got lots of experts in there and lots of beginning programmers. So there are no stupid questions. There are only stupid people. Wait, no, that's not. <laughs> They're only trolls. Strike. How about that? They're only trolls. Well, They're only trolls. No, but it's, seriously, it's a great community to jump into, and it's it's actually a lot of fun to see people hash out different ways of solving a single problem. Yeah, I really, I really love the, the the conversations they have on there. Yeah, they're, they're good. And you know what? They're they're not all like lackeys. They they will be critical of the show when they need to be critical. So it's a really good place to jump in and see whether or not we're doing our job right. Yeah. Now, uh, thanks to everyone who makes this show possible. Of course, that's to Lisa and to Leo for letting us do the show and for bringing on Lou as our full-time co-host. Also, special thanks to a man who sits behind the scenes. He pushes the buttons, but he doesn't get a lot of recognition. He's the man, the myth, the Eskimo, Zach. Zach, can you tell people where they can find you and your work? Thank you, Padre. You guys can find me on the Twitters at Eskimo Zach, that's Zach with an H, E-S-K-I-M-O-Z-A-C-H. Until next time, where you'll find us every Monday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Lou Maresca. And this has been Coding 101. End of line. <laughs>